you and I do such different types of comedy. You do. What are you talking about? <laughs> You've seen my stuff. Well, I You're like mean, a one-man show, edgy guy, right? That's why I'm sure. here. Yeah, yeah. But I that, here's how I would put it: You write jokes yes, that are just leave it there, and then, <laughs> and then you do what you do. You put on your little shows, and that's great. Oh and gosh, people, and that's great. I don't like how you said, "and that's great. great." I don't like that. I don't like how you said, "and that's great." Yeah, but that was the point. <laughs> So you do jokes that are that are the, the uh, I would describe as gallows humor, dark jokes, j jokes that sort yeah, of I mean, go. I'm, tr I'm trying to change it. I'm trying to. I mean, I'm good with jokes. I'm yes. very good at jokes. And the thing that you do, that narrative arc, and the the character driven jokes. Yeah, is kind of that's a it's a it's another level. It's a, it's a muscle I don't use very often. So there was there's one or two moments in a show where I'll tell the truth, and it yeah. really sings. And I'm trying to do oh, longer bits so of smart. stand up within it. Like trying to work that different muscle. Yes. I've got every, everything's a fastball with me. And that's great. Yes. And that's what people are paid to see. And I think you have to honor what the universe ordered. Yes. The universe ordered jokes. Yes. He's a comedian. You're a stand-up. You're doing that. That's my job. I'm so glad that you're interested in this idea of, with your next show, having jokes, 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 and then something that has a sentiment that you really feel. I, I, I think the audience is so smart as well. They get it in a heartbeat. They get what's a joke. Yeah. Well, that's a joke. He doesn't mean that. That's yeah. just a construct. Uh, I do a thing at the end of the show where I give young men advice on the talk. Yeah. The talk that you should have with your dad that no one is having with their dad anymore. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's important. It's like you can tell, oh, we, it's jokes, but he means this. Yeah. Young men should do it like that. Yeah. Really interesting sort of talk around consent. Uh, you know, those kind of issues that you kind of go, well, the people that need to hear that might not watch your show. Yes. But they'll watch, you know, the edgy jokes or whatever, and then they'll maybe pick it up along the way. That's interesting. I love that. I'm glad, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, and, and it's also like a testament to, you've been on stage for thousands of hours at this point, and so you are really capable of letting go of you you're when you're your persona that tells the types of jokes that you tell it's something of a persona and when yourself you're yourself and that's a, that's just from i think from hours of doing it it's, it is interesting that thing of like the different voices that we yeah have. like i'm very different on podcasts than i am on stage yeah and i kind of i listened back to a couple of podcasts recently because I was, I was doing um joe rogan's and uh I can listen back to like does it analysis or whatever to see what I'd said before on this. Yeah. I did a, uh, one about my sort of autobiography, and uh, it was kind of weird. Like it's a different. It's much more me. I'm much more very relaxed being myself. Yeah. On you know, just chatting or whatever. It's nice. Well, it's funny because the thing that I know about you and I appreciate it as a friend is uh, that you are very deeply generous and thoughtful in a way that your persona. Doesn't, yeah, doesn't allow doesn't for. Talk, yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's like, I, I think that thing of like happiness is expectations exceeded. Mm -hmm. And because of how I am on stage, yeah. when I meet people, they're always delighted. Oh, well, he seems much more friendly than I thought he was going to be. Yeah. Because if you watch my kind of hours on Netflix, you kind of think, oh, this guy. <laughs> wow. This guy's a lot. Dark. Yeah, yeah. Fun. Well, it's funny because like you, you have that joke where you're performing uh, for terminally ill children and you say... Uh, no, it was a gig for... Uh, a Montreal. Yeah, yeah, Montreal, yeah. Um, where, yeah, it was a cancer charity and everyone did great at the gig. It was really fun. And I think it was the... Uh, I was going on last and I said, uh, I said, well, I've got to be quick, we haven't got much time. Well, I have. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and, <laughs> and then I, then I said, I, I did this gig last year. Um, is anyone here from last year? Oh, yes. Spoiler. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I told a bunch of cancer jokes to people dying of cancer, but then I think that's when a dark sense of humor pays out. Yes. Like in the in the run of life, your sense of humor doesn't really. There's no. What's it doing? What's the Darwinian advantage of having a dark sense of humor? Well, it is when terrible things happen. Yeah. It's the way to cope to get through it. That that kind of that light on the worst possible day. Yeah. Is the thing that you go. It's, it's 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 the heartbreaker. It's like yeah. it makes things just a little bit better and you can kind of see that there is life beyond this. Yeah. So even on your worst day, you can laugh. You can take a moment because you, you can't be frightened and laugh at the same time. Yeah. So 
those little moments kind of mean the world. And, you know, the people that are never offended by the, the thing, you know, if the guy's dying or something, it's a, it's a, there's a big difference between, you know, people get, people sort of conflate the thing yeah. and the joke about the thing. Yeah. You know, the joke about the thing is fine. I've got no problem with people joking, but the thing is serious. Yeah. It's, you can kind of separate them out. I had a, like, I didn't know this feels like a decent enough forum to talk about. I had an extraordinary experience, like not to big myself up, but to big up comedy. I had an extraordinary experience where I do a thing at the end of the show where people send texts in. Mm -hmm. So people send text messages on before I come on stage and yeah. they can text in. So kind of like a virtual heckle. Oh, I love that. Out. But they send me like their favorite jokes and weird stuff and moral dilemmas. And yeah. they stitch up their friends and go, you know, <laughs> my friend is here with a date, but he's married or whatever, you know, crazy stuff. <laughs> right, right, right. And we're oh doing gosh. a gig in, I think it was in, uh, it was in Scandinavia. I think it was in um, uh, just outside, like two hours outside Stockholm. Did this gig and we got a message in. I hadn't seen it um, pre-show. And... This woman said, uh, I'm celebrating my, uh, like, 15 bonus years hmm. tonight uh, because of you. Hmm. Thank you. And oh, I didn't know what that meant. And so I get chatting to the girl in the audience. I said, who did bonus years? And she said, oh, I was, um, I'm a depressive. And I was going to kill myself when I was 15. And I was waiting till everyone wanted to sleep in the house. And I was going to hang myself. And I had nothing to do while I was waiting. So I was looking at YouTube and I found a clip of you and I laughed. And then I watched more and I kept laughing. And I'm alive now. My gosh. And it was like, I, ch I just didn't know what to do. Wow. I didn't know what to do with it. And you kind of go, that weird thing that we do just for fun, just, for, just to make people laugh. And you go, well, sometimes... Some people really need it. Yeah. You know, on occasion, there's that thing where you go, because what is suicide? It's the permanent solution to a temporary problem. Mm -hmm. It's no perspective. And what do jokes offer? Well, it's perspective. Yeah. That's what it's about. It's like pulling back from this embarrassing, terrible situation. Yeah. You're jumping out a window and you're going to kill yourself because you, you, you've got a sleep disorder, but somehow you manage to get the focus wide enough and it's a brilliantly funny uh, you know uplifting story yeah but it's a terrible thing happened yeah and having that it's just a really it's a really kind of it's not particularly about i mean it happened to be my stuff but it could have been anyone's stuff right it was just this gift of laughter and the idea that you could I, you don't know as well where it, where it ends up who's watching your special now and feeling like oh maybe i'm not so crazy I and feel like feel that's the difference human. between when I was younger doing comedy and now doing comedy is I think in my, my impulse when I started in my 20s was I want to be famous. I want to be successful. I want to make people laugh because it's this thing I, I do and whatever. And at a certain point, I think it does change over to the thing you're describing, which is, oh, actually, sometimes this has an effect on people's lives. And if you can do that, that's quite significant. Um, you know, when people talk about ambitions, they talk about results. Yeah. And I think talking about, like, what we're doing here, process. Yeah. Like, if you find something where you enjoy the process, not the results. Because people want to be movie stars. Yeah. I want to be a movie star. But I don't want to be an actor. Yeah. I want to have been in a movie. <laughs> I don't want to do it. I don't want to, get, I don't, I don't want to get up at five in the morning and film for the day and have someone else's in charge. That sounds fucking this awful. This is great. It's awful. It's a great observation. Yeah. But I, I, I want to have done that thing. Yeah, I, I want sure. to have written a book. I don't want to write another book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really hard. <laughs> it's, it's, but it's true, right? <clears throat> I'd love to have a hit album. Learning guitar? Ah. I don't even think I have to host this show. You can just go like this for five But don't you think that's five like... Hours. It's, it's this is too good. But it's I do. I think I think you're right. You're exactly right. But that thing of like finding the thing in life that you find the process. What's, what's easy for you? that other people find difficult. What What's play for you? I read yeah. a great story about, I think it's Steffi Graf had a thing where, I think some other girl gave up tennis when she found this out. She went, she went, she loves playing tennis. Yeah. And yeah, she went, oh, well, I love playing tennis, but ah, oh, the training. And she went, ah, oh, Steffi really enjoys the training. Mm. And you go, oh, you can't compete with that. You can't compete with that. If she really enjoys the training, if she likes, oh, getting up at six and she's yeah. out of bed going, right, gym first, then practice, then whatever. She's loving it. Yeah. And someone else is like, oh, you can't compete with that. Yeah. What's the thing that people just can't compete with you? You just, you're, 
it's so easy for you to do because that's your thing. That's what I kind of want for everyone. I think that thing of like, it's not comedy for everyone, but like finding that purpose where you go, yeah, that's, I'm trying to be more stoic in life and just write jokes. Yeah. That's, that's what I do. Yeah, it's what you do. Yeah. Do you ever find that, you know, for example, you know, we don't have much time or I do, you know, that joke. It's like, do you ever find that in a situation like that, it backfires? Like, does it ever not go right? Yeah, for yeah. You? I did. I did a gig for it was a breast cancer charity, and I went on stage and I said, "It's great, great to be here." If, if this was for leg or ass cancer, I wouldn't have shown up. But oh my God. breasts, they mean, mean a lot to me. <laughs> Jesus, no, I mean literally <laughs> like, tumbleweed. <laughs> oh God, okay, everyone. But that thing of like, I think the, the it, again, it's perspective. Yeah, the, the terrible experience in the moment then becomes a funny story. Yeah. And isn't that life? Isn't yeah. That the whole thing about going a little bit of perspective makes things kind of yeah. okay. You said this thing last time you were on the podcast, which really stuck with me, which is you were like, you were like, introduced me to a comedian. I'll, 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 t I'll show you someone who, whose parents were sick. Or whatever. <clears throat> if, you're, if you're talking to a comedian, the question you should always ask is which one of your parents was sick? Yes. One of them will be. You're, you're, this is a, a compulsion to make things okay. Yeah. Because what do we, what do we do? What's our job? Well, we change, we change people's moods. Yeah. So you sit down in a theater and the lights go down. We change their mood. We, we you know, it's serotonin and endorphins. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, that, it's that thing of, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, we're drug dealers. <laughs> yes. That the drugs are on you. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's right. Oh, man, I love that. It's because I always think about it is like, it's my, like you were saying, it's your coping mechanism. I always think it's my coping mechanism and I'm sharing my coping mechanism with you, the audience. Yeah. Here's, here's what I got. Here's what I've come up with. If this works for you, that's good. Yeah. And the, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's, a really, it's a really lovely thing. I think it's also, it's a, it's a muscle you can kind of work. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're feeling down or whatever, watching lots of comedy, really, it does kind of help. Yeah. It's watching it with other people seems to be the sweet source. It's a weird thing where when you watch a special on your own, yeah. on your phone on the way to work, you smile. You yeah. The funniest comic in the world. Whoever you think is the, 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 the current goat, you can watch him and go, great. Yeah. Great. If you're in a group with 30 people, it's why I think people like TV at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. Those Communal are, television. You watch it with your family. That's yeah. why that episode of Friends was the greatest episode of Friends ever, because everyone watched it together. Yeah. With the last Seinfeld, because people watched it together. They, got, they had friends come around and watch it and... Terrific. Right, it's an event. Yeah, oh, it's social. Laughter is a social noise. Yeah. We're signaling to each other. But y you, you're like on a world tour right now. You're going everywhere. You're going... Mean, not right now. 20 <laughs> but, years. I've not, not been off the road. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's so true. This, but, tour, this <laughs> tour finishes Easter next year. I have two weeks off. The next <laughs> tour begins. There's no... Right. It's my job. You're so. permanently on tour. Yeah. yeah, you're a touring comedian, which is what I am too. But but you're going to Bangkok. You're going to Australia. You're going, uh, you know, uh, yeah. everywhere. 40 countries. Iceland, you know. Yeah. 250 gigs so far this year, yeah. Is it, at a certain point, are you just going, do you ever go like, what's wrong with me? Like, what am I doing? Like, why am I so compelled to go everywhere on the planet and do I, this I, thing? I, I don't know. I think I've got into a business where... Um, I mean, I had a joke about it years ago. I said, I'm the hardest working man in comedy, which is like being the best looking guy in the Burns unit. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> the, 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 the bar is low. Yeah. People do not work hard in our industry. Oh, they interesting. Get into, they get into comedy and they write a show or they write 40 minutes of stuff. Yeah. And they, they rest. <laughs> yeah. jokes are, the jokes are the bullet. You're the yeah. gun. <clears throat> right. You, you know, that working that muscle of like, it's always like, uh, just write more, write more, yeah. write more. Get better. I think I've got better this year. That's interesting. I think I'm like, I'm better at joke writing, better at editing, putting in, listen, I mean, people might be watching this going, ah, this guy, I hate him. Yeah, hate what he, sure. But it's that thing of like, if you like what I do, like there's a, there's a, you're, you're kind of getting better at the instrument. Like I'm always amazed. I've got friends that are musicians. I've got my friend Ronnie, he's a drummer. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I'm with him, <laughs> backstage, he's, drumming on his leg yeah he's got pads he's got practice gear. you'll be having a conversation he's practicing it's like well i've got to mm -hmm. try to get better mm -hmm. try to get better at drumming yeah one, one of the best drummers that's ever lived yeah and he's yeah. trying to get better all the time yeah because he doesn't want to be better than anyone else yeah 
he wants to be better than he was last year. Than he was last year. There's, there's a lot of talk about goats in comedy. <laughs> yes, I there up, is. I was up drinking with one of them last night, and it was fantastic. We had a great time. But I, I give a fuck about the greatest of all. The greatest of all time. The, the, who's the greatest? Well, you'll just be replaced by the next greatest. The of next course. That comes through. I'm such an advocate of comedy and the idea that we're in this phase at the moment where this is a golden age. Yeah. And obviously in the golden age, everything just looks yellow. Yeah. You can't see it because we're in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. But it feels to me like um, George Carlin and um, uh, Lenny Richard Bruce Pryor, or Richard Pryor. Lenny yeah. Bruce, they were John the Baptist. Yeah, they, they set this and they were there, so yeah. we could watch them when we were at the right age to kind of to, to to take that and move it forward. Yeah, and then there's you know, and then you've got this generation of you know Louis C.K. and Chris Rock and coming through, and then what's next? You know, I yeah. see Mark Normand and 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 uh, Sam Morell, and I see Beth Stelling and uh, Michelle Wolf, and these coming. There's another generation coming through. You go, oh well, the, when those guys hit. That it's going to be that. Yes. It seems to be that thing of like around 50. Yes. People make their best work. That's a lovely thing as well in our industry. It's an unusual thing about our music, profession. Yes. If you're in music, good luck. Good luck with that. Good luck doing anything out of your 20s. No, I know. It's, I really do feel lucky to be in my 40s right now because I'm like, oh, it's a good time to be a comedian. It's the moment where you're experiencing. The essentially com comedy is sharing your experience combined with how witty you can be about your life experience. And in your 40s and 50s, I think that actually does. Uh, there's yeah. a there's a there's a, a collision of those two. What's well, interesting? So little arcs. of my work is about sharing my life experience. Yeah. So little of it, and it's it's uh it's something I should work on. It's because it's it's an interesting thing to kind of go. Yeah. I find uh, you know I, I saw the show in London and you know brought Caroline. We had a great time. And you kind of go, oh, God, I love this. Yeah. And I kind of think, and there's a bit of me that goes, oh, I can never do that. Yeah. And then there's another bit of me that goes, oh, I could probably do that. No, of course you could. And and, you, and it, the proof is in your book, because your book really goes there. You talk about your parents. You talk about your relationship with a lot of a lot of people. Mm. And, I, and I love your book. I've, I've actually, t I've talked about your book to so many people because... That is not reflected in sales. You need to, you need to, you need to, you need to send them a link. I guess this podcast. I mean, we need a hundred. Really have we readers. need a thousand people to pledge today that they're going to yeah. buy the book? Well, because it's that's the charity at the end of the show. <laughs> it's called Before and Last Day. It's a book, and the money goes to a very worthy cause. Well, I, here's myself for the book. The book is about how to implement humor in your life whether you're a teacher a nurse a doctor because ultimately humor does make most situations better and i think that there's not a book about that and you did it and you did it perfectly yeah it's a nice it's it's kind of a self-help book about it's echo tale uh totally for dummies yes it, because the people that need that don't might not read that people that read <laughs> biographies of comedians or like my stuff and they kind of go oh that's fun it's gonna be fun it's a funny book it kind of might not read that stuff but it's kind of pointing them in the right direction it's just like there's loads of quotes in it. That stuff that yeah. really has resonated with me and I kind of find... It's funny you should bring up Tolle because when I was in London and I was feeling down, you, the two of the people who were uh, there for me were were you. You 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 know, you got the sense that I felt down and because I was away from my wife and daughter for four and a half weeks. And then Eckhart Tolle. I was, uh, Pete Holmes recommended The Power of Now and it was very helpful for yeah. me. I, I fell asleep to it every night. It is, it's, it's really beautiful. It's a really beautiful uh, thing. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful because it, it does this thing. And I highly recommend this book to people, by the way, is- Ah, they're not gonna buy mine now. Well, I'm gonna recommend two books. They're not, I'm gonna no recommend- No one buys two books. <laughs> this is insanity. Oh my God, I know we're in Brooklyn, but Christ. You and, books. you and Tola have been at each other's throats for years. Fuck that guy. Uh, no, but he, but, but he, yeah, he, he makes this point in this, in the book and I'm probably butchering it, but it's like separating your, your mind from your consciousness and acknowledging that the things that your mind is saying are most likely not even true. Yes. I think that thing of like, for me, the, uh, if you look up the, the, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, yeah. uh, thought patterns. It's, I found that a revelation. Just if you do C CBT, yeah. thought patterns, if you have like 
uh, recurring thoughts. Yes. If you have like circular thinking, if you catastrophize, if you're sort of thinking about the um, what might have been or what what could happen, sure. worst case scenarios, you're kind of torturing yourself. Yes. And that relationship you have with yourself is the most important relationship in your life. Yes. You're constantly kind of in your head. Yeah, and I think that the comedy profession breeds that type of thinking because we're rewarded for overthinking, for yeah. over uh, uh, c- catastrophizing in a way because we're just we're, we're extrapolating out on hypotheticals all the time. Well, but I, I think the the gift of anxiety, I think, is jokes. Yes, I think the fact of you have a mind that's whirring at a certain speed. Yeah, and at four a.m. in the morning, it might decide to think about something terrible happening. Yeah as opposed to the joke that you give it to work on. So I think actually the more work that you give it, yeah, you know, tired dog is a happy dog. Give your mind something to do. Yeah. What you're describing is exactly how I ended up being a, a working comedian is that my parents were so averse to me being a comedian that I thought the only way that I can approach it's this. It's not just your parents. A, a couple of guys at the cellar as well. We've, <laughs> I can't help myself. I'm so mean to you. That's so fun. <laughs> One of our producers, Mabel, was asking earlier, she goes, does Jimmy make fun of you off stage too? And I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she yeah. goes, what, is, what does he make fun of you about? I go, I don't know, just everything. It's just yeah. pan, I find it pans so, across the it board. It feels like that thing of like, it feels like family. It feels like yes. such a lovely, yes. there's a lovely Australian phrase. I, I, so I uh, you listen to your show and nice people, they might object to the C word, but there's a thing in in Australia where... I feel like I know what the punchline is going to be. Yeah, but there's a thing in Australia where if you have someone that you... Uh, a very close friend, uh, you would call... Uh, a very close mate, yes. you would call a uh, cunt. And if you have someone that you think is a cunt, you'll call him mate. <laughs> I love that. I don't think anything you could say would upset me. That's interesting. But it's the... It's, but, you know... Sometimes when people are mean, I mean, people are genuinely mean. Like, occasionally when you get cancelled, the worst thing about being cancelled is you find out who your friends are. Yeah. Which is wonderful and terrible. <laughs> yes. It's often not who you thought it was. Yes. There's a, well, there's one time which was kind and, of And cancelled is a little overstatement because it, in well, the, sometimes you get cancelled. Uh, piled on. Because you didn't yes. end your career. No, but it's, You had the financial thing, and then you had the, the thing with the joke that was controversial. Oh, I had, I've had like eight things with jokes that have okay. you know, been kind of front page news. I'm thinking yeah. about doing a bit at the end of the show where I go, I've been canceled a couple of times. Let's go through them. <laughs> uh, and then you retell all the jokes yeah. and kind of go. And then I did like 10 jokes at the end of that, which are, and here's what I think is going to be the next one. Right. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That seems good. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a. I think it's a good. So idea you find out what you're. So you're saying you find out who your friends are. Yeah, I mean that's that's very painful, but also it's brilliant. But you get much closer to people. Like I have a thing now on. I think this is a. It's a really interesting thing. I think this is a transferable skill. If you take anything away from this podcast, take this. When someone is having a bad day. Yeah. Call. Yeah, call. You don't know what to say. Sometimes it's okay just to call and go. I don't know what to say. Yes. But I heard your mum died. Yeah. I don't know what to say, but I heard you got the diagnosis. Didn't know what to say. Yeah. I know a text message doesn't seem enough, but I thought I'd just reach out and let you know that I'm thinking of you. That little... Th- you never forget who texts you on the day. Yeah. On the, you, if you're on the front of the paper and like people are going, you know, well, we might not work with them anymore. It's the people that call and go, no, no, we got you. Yeah. You got to, you know, I always think there's a great um, therapeutic phrase, let's right size. Yeah. Let's right size this problem. Yeah. Because sometimes it's like, oh, I, I remember um, James Corden, who's incredibly good to me in, mm-hmm. in crises. He's always kind of reached out. And I remember the last time I had a thing, I called him and went, ah, what do you think, man? He went, you've got to right size this. Mm. You told a joke mm-hmm. and some people didn't like it. Yeah. That's what's happened. Yeah, that's what yeah. happened. And then I was going, yeah, but I think that you told a joke and some people didn't like it. It's, it's going to be okay. So one of the slow round questions is, um, is there a song that makes you cry? Uh, yes. Yes. I think uh, I find music is a great way to kind of, uh, it's sort of the only way I really connect with grief. Mm. And my mother was a big music fan. Like we would go and buy records every uh, Monday when the mm. records were released. We'd go to the Slough Record Center and the guys in there knew us and they would play records and we'd buy some singles. You know, you buy the singles and take them home and dance around the living room. 
It's great. Yeah. It was fun lady. And she was very, before she died, um, it was kind of the year before, 18 months before, Jeff Buckley's Grace came out. Mm. And we were very into that record. Yeah. We were into kind of Nick Drake and Jeff Buckley. And yeah. so Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah. The we, Hallelujah, way yeah. Way before it was a hit. I mean, like a good, you know, 10 years before it. But it's, it's kind of that, there's a great documentary about that song, actually. It's a wonderful, wonderful documentary. Sort of a love letter to Montreal and Leonard Cohen. And yeah. It's phenomenal. But about the journey that song sort of went on. But that he, Jeff Buckley's version of that, it was, uh, so we played that at her funeral. Uh-huh. And it was, so for years I kind of couldn't listen to it again. And I heard it again recently. It's, you kind of, you feel it again. It's weird with grief as well, because when you're initially in it, you want that thing to stop. Yeah. And then 22 years later, what you wouldn't give for those tears yeah. again, because you can't remember it. Yeah. You almost can't remember what they looked like, what they, what they sounded like, their voice, whatever. Those little details are gone. And you, you, know, it's, you kind of miss it. Yeah. I, I've got my theory on grief is it's cumulative. Yeah. So sometimes when someone's dog dies, you need to be there for them because it's everyone they've ever lost. Yeah. And then as we get older, it's our own mortality. Yeah. So we're thinking about life, the big stuff, the stuff we should be thinking about. I mean, the whole of society and civilization is about the obfuscation of decay. Yeah. And then the dog dies and you go, oh, we're just here for a minute. Yeah. That, that great quote of, you know, every man has two lives. And his, his, uh, his second one begins when he realizes he only has one. Yes. What do you feel like from your mother you will want to make sure you pass on to your two children? I mean, I think she was a very funny woman, very yeah. full of life. I think it's, you know, it's easy to kind of, people become saints um, <laughs> yes. when they don't, later. no one bad ever died. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, she was really wonderfully funny and had a great kind of, uh, I think that thing of like, it was a great mood. Yeah. When she was, she was depressed. I think she was the one that was sick. Yeah. Uh, all of my life. I just thought it was normal. Yeah. That someone wouldn't get dressed for the day and still be in their pajamas when you came home from school. Yeah. I just kind of thought that was just. <laughs> what people do, yeah. Yeah, that's what, what, what do you want? Um, but then when she was funny, when you could make her laugh and make things okay. It was yeah. Just, you know, what so makes the atmosphere it? in the house, the atmosphere of lightness. Do you have ki- Do you have a kids joke for your kids that makes them laugh? Uh, do you? Have, they, they laugh pretty much constantly. They're in, yeah. just in a good mood. Yeah, I've seen you with your kids and you're a riot with your kids. It's weird because you don't know who you're going to be. I found that very interesting when I, I didn't want to be the f- a father for the longest time because I didn't want to be my father. Yes. And then you realize, no, I'm not going to make those mistakes. I'm going to make new mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, but it's interesting, like finding out who you are when you play that role yeah so for me it was like being being a dad you kind of went well am i um, maybe i'll be the strict one yeah maybe i'll be the fun one maybe you know what's the and what do you think you are i don't know it's really fun i really like the voice that i have my theory on this is like i'm such a dummy yeah i for the longest time i thought i was life is it was a video game and i had a cheat yeah i had like a cheat where i was like i didn't have kids it was easy. Yes. So easy. I've got nothing to worry about. Yeah. I was just at a very low stakes table. Yes. <laughs> no, no, there's no stakes here. Uh, there's no, we're playing for nothing. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. And then you have kids. You go, oh my God. Suddenly, yeah. everything matters. Yeah. It's really good. I think that... Uh, yeah, I think that's right on. And I think that that's probably what, you know, we were talking about how in your next, your next hour, you may work in, whether it's stories or something sentimental or, or real... It's got to be about your kids, because I feel like yeah, no, there's, there's I, good, I know you before and after. There's a nice twenty-minute thing on. Oh, there is. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's like just one-liners and talking about kids. You know. Yeah. And, uh, jokes are my love language. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a joke about love languages actually. Was, I think it was pretty decent. Okay, I knew. Like it's, you're familiar with the theory of love languages, so there's like some people like it might be acts of service or it might be gifting. Yeah. Uh, well, my love language is coming in people. Oh my god. <laughs> It's how I show affection. <laughs> it's really funny, isn't it? Because it's, it's the misdirect of people kind of going, oh, I've heard of this. Yeah. Acts of- I've heard of this. <laughs> I mean, is that in the new hour? No, that's like in the new, new. That's the, the, the new hour. That will come out. On- oh, my God. That's a riot. That's funny. That's No, I have a joke in my new hour right now where I say, um, I basically talk about how you know, Jen did something nice for me. She made me, 
she made me pancake. And I go, you heard that correctly. It was just the one because she's familiar with my health profile. She knows that the, the right amount of pancakes for me to eat is just pancake. And so, wow. I, so I wanted to do something nice for her because my love language is keeping score. And I go, and if you're if you're laughing, yours is too. And if you're not yeah. laughing, yours is too. Yeah. You're just losing. Yeah. And if if uh, if you're not laughing, then I'm one ahead. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. What's well, funny because Jenny, my wife Jenny, who you know, uh, uh, saw the show, and her takeaway, and you know, my new hour, her takeaway was like, I think the best thing is my love language is keeping score. Like I think that, that I think that that's my favorite tidbit from the show, and I think you should right. blow that out. Yeah, it's interesting. It, you make me think of a thing I thought of years ago. I never did anything with it, but the idea that what's changed in the world. I remember being a kid. We, you, you'd get pizza, and yeah. everyone would get a slice. Yeah, maybe two slices. Yeah. Now people get their own pizza. <laughs> what happened? What happened? <laughs> what happened what are we working on type 3 diabetes what are we doing, what are we doing? it used to be so funny but you remember that as a kid you would order a pizza no you're absolutely right what are right. we getting on the pizza I don't know ham and pineapple everyone's having a slice okay and then oh there's another slice yeah great lovely what what, are we the... all finished yeah now everyone get what do you a pizza each. What the hell happened? The fuck are you doing? I don't, yeah, no, we, we didn't. No one used to get a pizza each. Yeah, no, no, it makes no sense. It's insane. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great. Are you doing that? That's no, not anything. <laughs> that's not anything. <laughs> what am I going to do with that? Your Pete Davidson joke in that roast is yeah. so funny and i, I think had a really interesting conversation about that recently because um i met eric weinstein uh, who's phenomenal public intellectual okay he's kind of, i think the founder of the intellectual dark web okay I met him at this thing and he went i i know you <laughs> and i went i went uh i went oh um i just got one of those faces yeah yeah and he, he went no no i, I you're a comedian right I, I said yeah i'm a big fan of your work and he went um he went that uh, you did that that joke about Pete Davidson. Mm -hmm. I hated that joke. I thought it was disgusting. Really? Yeah. It was really interesting, and it was really heartfelt, and it was really, I mean, he's, he's incredible. I he's, hated that joke. I hated it. I thought, thought it was disgusting. Wow. I said, and, oh, I said, well, I checked with Pete that it was going, he went, you know, I, I hated it. Oh, wow. But it was that thing and where you go, it's, it's a, some, for some people that, that's such a sensitive uh, topic. Yeah. That you, you you can you can never joke about it right uh, you and can the, never make and, it okay i mean it was you know i think at the roast if you're at a roast and you're going to be joking about that kind of stuff then it's it's all it's open season i guess yeah um, i mean the joke the joke uh, if people don't know it is 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 uh, is is uh, well I, I pete davidson's father um was a firefighter in uh he died in the, in the twin yeah. towers and i know firefighters say Hey, we're just doing our job, but that, I mean, genuinely, that's a heroic thing to go in and try and save people's lives. And I can't believe here at the roast, uh, you know, people would would uh, would joke about Pete Davidson's father. This is not the roast of Pete Davidson's father. That was in two thousand one. <laughs> it's still funny to me. It's a funny joke. <laughs> but but you did run it by him. That's interesting that you did because he was well, it, that, because I didn't know. Like I knew some of the other people on the on that panel, and yeah. you kind of go and that's, and the kind of dumb jokes. But I went. That's a very sensitive thing. Yes. And if he'd gone, I don't want to talk about. Please it. Please don't do that. Yeah, because yeah. it's that thing you, you kind of go. It sort of felt like it belonged to him as well. That's yes. his story to tell. Yes. That's his thing to. Well, it's funny. It's like. There's the Anne Lamott book, Bird by Bird, which is actually sitting right here. Cool. Where, where it's a brilliant book. And, and she goes, uh, sometimes people say, I don't have a story to tell. And she goes, if you had a childhood, you have a story. And I think that's true. I, I feel like I, in my new hour, I'm just digging a lot into my childhood and how the thing I'm digging into thematically my new hour is seeing the world through my daughter's eyes, who's I, eight years old. I, I was about to literally quote that because the, that thing of having kids yeah, where you go... Like my thing of like, why is the kids crying in the swimming pool? Yeah, because they think they think this is forever. What do you mean? What you you put a child yeah. in a swimming pool and they go <laughs> right? We're wet now. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know we're getting out. <laughs> they don't know we're going to towel oh, off. Oh, yeah. This is our forever now. Why are they crying? Because they're cold. 
Yeah. Because then, oh, I guess the world's now cold. Uh, yes. They have no idea. No, I think that's right. And I think, so my new hour is about how seeing, seeing the world through my daughter's eyes, I realized that when I was a kid, I thought my parents knew everything. And now yeah. I'm 45 and I'm the grown up. I go, oh, I don't know anything. Yeah, it's interesting, that thing. I think there is a societal change that you could talk about there. Yeah. Because it used to be the only way you could learn how to shave was to ask your father. Ask your dad. And now you can Google it. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. And I think there's something about the YouTube video that tells you how to do your laces that is less valuable than finding it from uh, an elder. It doesn't yeah. Mean father, mother, whatever. Yeah. An elder. Yeah. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I mean, I think recently, the, the one that sticks to mind is the, don't be the best, be the only. Yeah. Be, just be yourself. Just be yourself. It, it, you're enough. Yeah, I know it's, you're it's enough. It's also that thing of like, acceptance of what you are. Yeah. It seems to be a bit of a, um, an issue in the world. Because it used to be that self was, if you think about what self is, it's, it's a mediation between how you feel inside, yeah. your character, and your reputation in the world, how people see you. Yeah. So knowing that thing of how other people see you yeah. and how you see yourself. So you say when you're 21, I want to be a comedian. And the world goes, mm, maybe. Yeah. You're funny. And then you do some spots and you give the world uh, irrefutable evidence. You are who you say you are. Yeah. That's a, that's a big kind of life lesson. I think sometimes people are living so much online. Yeah. They, they almost become avatars of themselves. Yeah. I think that, that mediation of self is very kind of, that's a very interesting phase in life of like finding who you are and does the world, yeah. does the world agree? And then kind of that thing of, uh, I'm very into that honoring what the world ordered. Yeah. The world ordered a stand-up comedian, do that. Yes. But everything else is a, is a distraction. Yeah. I've had that recently where, where you know, like if I'm taking the subway in, to, to uh, if I'm taking the F train to West 4th Street to the Comedy Cellar to work on jokes, I will not listen to music. I won't listen. To, I will. I have a notebook, and I'm watching what's going on in the yeah. world. Well, here's the the great gift of boredom. I think there's a. I think we're overstimulated as a society. Yeah. You know, someone's listening to this podcast now, on a walk. Yeah. With the dog, and they're not there. Yeah. They're here a couple of times a day. Your head should be in the same place as your feet. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great piece of advice. A couple of times a day. A couple of times a day. But we're you know, slightly over and feet. Like, my childhood was waiting at bus stops for 45 minutes. Yeah. So that seemed to be a lot of my childhood. Yeah. And, and you'd have to kind of amuse yourself. Is your life different than you expected it to go? Yes. It has exceeded all expectations. What did you think it was going to be? I thought it would be... Um, I, I don't think I gave it enough thought. I think there was a weird thing of, you know, what they don't teach you at Harvard Business School, what they, what you, what they don't focus on in schools, which they should. Yeah. Is like the, knowing yourself, knowing who you are. Yeah. So I think that people should teach stand-up comedy in schools. Yeah. Because really it's about finding your voice. Yeah. Right? So we do different styles of comedy, different people. Yeah. We found our style. Yeah. It's it, like I could hear, I could see a bit of your material written down, no. Oh, that sounds like Mike. Yeah. That, that, and you could look at one of my one lines and go, yeah, it sounds like a Jimmy joke. Yeah. Like, you found your voice through comedy. Yeah. You found a way to communicate and connect with other people through yeah. comedy. These are incredible skills for teenagers. If we could teach them how to write jokes, how to structure a joke, how to think in that way. Yeah. How to use that language, if you think of comedy as a language. Yeah. It's real value at all stages of life. Yeah. I, I love that. A, I think I'm working on this. Yeah, this. The, the, that's the next book. The um, uh, or it might be like an online course. <clears> the <throat> teaching jokes. It's. I think it's good. We've done two workshops, and it's. We're getting comics like new comics to write sixty jokes a week. Oh wow! Ten jokes a day. And, and that's your. And that's your approach. Is is sort of like writing writing jokes. Every kind made of, of jokes. Everything's made every, of jokes. Different styles, different types of jokes. Because most comics, they kind of they wondering why that joke isn't paying off. They go. Well, you're telling different jokes. They yes. all have the same structure. You only do pullback reveals. Right. You can't only do those. A couple of rules of three, some pullback reveals. Like, there's 50 joke types. Roughly. Right. You need to switch it up. Yes. Put different things in. That's not getting the result because... And there's different ways to approach this. Yeah. You've got a funny idea. What's the best way to present it? Yes. It doesn't have to be the first way you thought of.
I wrote this joke that um, recently, which is we took our daughter to the dentist because she had a, an infection in her tooth and they pulled out her tooth and it was awful and painful. And her grandparents and her grandparents felt so bad they gave her a hundred dollars. And so we pulled out the other 30 because we had to pay for the dentist because everyone's going to pull their weight around here. That's that, that's all I got. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice idea. Uh, I think there's something in there's something in that. I, I wonder is it should it be the because you know that you didn't do that. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure, sure. So I yeah. wonder with you. And they gave her a hundred dollars for for a tooth. Yeah, and she's got thirty one teeth left. <laughs> yes, and I. And it wasn't until I saw the bill from the dentist that's, I thought, that's hang a, on, she's got another 31 teeth. That, I like that. It's we the, might need the, the inversion. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, yeah, the, and then I got the bill for the dentist. The and I said, well, dentist, she's got thought, 31 more teeth. Yeah, yeah. 31 more teeth. <clears throat> that's really nice. Yeah. I said to the dentist, have you got any other kids' teeth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. It's great. That's a I good mean, inversion of, of, of... It's some version of like, you're <laughs> starting a business selling baby teeth to old people. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that, there's something in there. Yeah, there's, there's something there. But it's got to be the bill of... You got the bill, yeah. That's an interesting okay. reconfiguration of the same. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. And then the continuation of the love love languages keeping score um, mm -hmm. that I was telling you earlier is that... And I and I, this is like a really half-baked half, half -baked thing, but I think, it's a, I think it's very ripe for something because my, my wife describes me as the narrator of our marriage because I'll be... I'll be, and it's, I'm so embarrassed of this, but I'll be doing the dishes and I'll be like, so I'm doing the dishes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and then right. I'm, I'm going to grab a pint of ice cream because your parents are coming over and then I'm going to take the, the hair out of the, uh, the, 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 the drain and the shower and blah, blah. And then she'll, she'll just be like, yeah, you don't have to say all that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, she'll, and, and, and you, 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 I mean, it's an old reference. I don't know what the modern equivalent would be, but you're the, you're the DVD commentary. Yes. Is that's stuck right. On. That's right. She's trying to watch the movie of your life. Yes. And you've got the DVD commentary. It's like... Right. You've got the subtitles on. And we, I don't know how to fix it. So the last thing we do is working out for a cause. And of course, we're going we're gonna to donate to your book and yes. have people buy your book. But is um, there an organization that you like to contribute to and will contribute to them and link to them in the show notes? I don't know. What, what's, what's a good New York cause? I always think like that thing of like trying to give something locally. Is, I think uh, a, a, I, I, well, we always try to contribute to the food bank um, because uh, uh, I just think they're, they're so good at stretching a dollar. Uh, so we'll contribute uh, to Feeding America at feedingamerica.org. And uh, we'll link to that in the show notes. And thank you, Jimmy, for being my friend, for being there for me when I was in London. And uh, it's great and, to see you, man. And thanks. Yeah, this is always, I, I'd love seeing you. It's, it's been an honor and a privilege for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>